we wanted him to come to San Jose and uh, spend some time with us, but it did not materialize. So we, four of us, the three of us, we drove down to Los Angeles where he was, and uh, he said, uh, "You, you know, you came all the way here for what?" I said, "Well, no, no, we wanted to meet you." So that is my first introduction to Professor Basu and. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> so th this year, you know, uh, we invited him to attend the home and uh, be with us, and he's graciously accepted. Now, as I was saying, a speaker is what he is becoming, not what he was. You can all read what he has been, where he has been, but I have known him from last uh, two days, and I know where he's going. That is what I can see, and I can maybe share with you. Uh, this Thursday. We had a Savitri reading in San Jose, and uh, he was saying how, from his understanding of Shirobindo, this is what is happening. And that, those are the things we want to share with people. And that I think he has a lot to share. He has so much wisdom. He has done so much research, and he's working on another research that we can participate in making it happen. Now, those are the things I want to share with you, and I would rather let him speak about what he wants to. Share and how he sees the yoga of Mother and Shivendra working in the world today, the manifestation, the new creation that is happening right here today. Thank you. Thank you, Chandresh, for your kind words of introduction. After all that build up, I will tell you what I am feeling like. If I am permitted to compare a great man with a small guy, Mark Twain was asked to speak at a public meeting once. It started by saying, Cicero was a great man, but is no longer with us. Shakespeare is a greater man, he is gone. I am Mark Twain, not feeling very well either. <laughs> Still, I will try my best. So Dave Hutchinson has invited me. And Vishnuvai, Chandresh, and Kalpana have been looking after me so well as if I'm a demigod, which I'm not. So I will first tell you this is not going to be a scholarly lecture. I'm not going to quote chapter and verse from the life divine or synthesis of yoga or whatever. I will tell you exactly for I am at this stage of my understanding of Sri Aurobindo. It will be more a personal chat than a lecture. I hope that suits you. Yeah. Oh, Anandamai, Chaitanamai, Sattamai, Parame. Offered to the Supreme Aditi, full of delight, full of consciousness, full of being. Children of the Mother. First thing I like to impress upon you is this. At the present state of my understanding, Sri Aurobindo's vision, message and life is this. Everything has to be seen, judged talked about from the point of view of the divine and not of man. If you read his writings carefully, you will find over and over again he says, the purpose of creation is a complete manifestation, self-unfolding, self-expression of the divine in the world. All this talk about supramental evolution, transformation of nature, and so on and so forth, are really means, instruments. They are not the aims of the yoga. This might come as a surprise to many people. The whole talk about supramental evolution has been so much blown up that people don't realize it is only the first step towards fulfilling the purpose of God in the world. You forget about yourself. Instant the divine in your heart. That is the yoga. In the second canto of the book one of Savitri, entitled The Issue, 
Shivendra says about Savitri, the fixity of cosmic events fastened by indivisible links, she must disrupt. Dislodge by a soul's force, her own past, a block on the immortal's road. So take heed, immortals is coming and may knock at your door anytime, depending on your preparation and your receptivity. You will remember that the golden but small book, the mother, she says there are two powers or forces that can bring about the goal of the yoga. One is human aspiration or earth's aspiration and another is a coming down of grace. I've just quoted from the Savitri about the immortal's road. Apparently the suggestion is that he is coming, who he is will say in a few minutes. On the other hand, the other side of the yogic encounter, the really human aspiration, he speaks of that in the other canto, the vision and the boon. He speaks of man by saying, a borrower of supernatural gold, he paves the way to immortality. So we have to go up to the divine only because the divine could come down to us. It is a very paradoxical situation. The divine has manifested the world, but is not manifest in the world. Is screened, veiled, hidden, waiting to be discovered by us. But who are us? Who are we? We are all limited God. There is in the vision of the moon another tremendous line full of significance and I don't think people have understood the meaning of it entirely even now. A God come down and greater by the fall. How can you be greater by your fall? This is because, and this is by the theme of my lecture, the divine is waiting to self-discover him. Another aspect of his own being, consciousness, delight, joy, power, whatever, which he does not know about it yet. Can it be the divine does not know something? Not the divine as such, not God per se the divine limited in the world. There's a letter of Shurabindo in which it says there are different levels of being and consciousness hierarchically arranged one on top of the other. All of them have an impact on events in the world and on human life. There are things there which are trying to manifest themselves in the world, in the physical being of man and the earth consciousness but all of them don't get realized. And yet, there is an attempt going on on the part of the divine himself for a new self-discovery. It is self-discovery by divine himself as what? The material divine. He still has to know that he has assumed materiality to make it divinized. This is the purpose of the yoga. Why then the supermind? You must know, as Shivendra said over and over again, that there are certain levels of consciousness above the human mind and below the supermind. Incidentally, to give a brief description of the supermind, we would say, supermind is the divine's knowledge of himself and his own native power of acting. You will see that he is describing supermind as knowledge hyphenated will, comprehensive integral knowledge and infallible all effective will combined together. Where does it come from? From the consciousness force, the chit shakti. Consciousness becomes knowledge, force becomes will. This supermind has been described by Sri Aurobindo as the initial coming out of the divine. First movement, first dynamis, looking towards the world that is to be, that is himself is going to be. So if this is the supermind, all knowledge and self-knowledge and world knowledge, 
to know the divine integrally, and that's a very favorite word with Sri Aurobindo, one has to attain to the supramental consciousness. Starting from the higher mind, illumined mind, intuitive mind, over mind, links, linking and joining the human mind and the super mind, on any of these levels of the consciousness, the self can be known. It is not true that the mind cannot know God. It can, only partially, incompletely. Therefore, with a certain amount of error attached to that knowledge. There is the Kena Upanishad, the saying that mind cannot attain to God. On the other hand, it says, Manusai by Praptavyam, by mind itself it has to be attained. Now, is there a contradiction? No. I think there's a hint here of Shoyamindu's metaphysical psychology, namely, mind itself has several levels. On the lowest level, you can't know God. On the higher levels, linking it to the supermind, the knowledge of self can be had, obtained, achieved, accomplished. This brings me to the point that it is absolutely impossible to attain the supramental consciousness without knowing the self. Which self? What is called in Sanskrit the Atman, the one reality in all. This is not the psychic being, the self which is one in all. If you do not know this, you really have not attained any knowledge of God. And this can be known on levels of consciousness below the supermind. So by the higher mind or illumined mind or intuitive mind and much better by the over mind, you know the self as the one in all. But this will not give you the complete knowledge or integral knowledge because those of you who have studied showing the psychology will know the over mind has the inherent knowledge of one on this topmost level and yet it prefers one aspect of the divine to another. That means the knowledge is not integral. Either it prefers the impersonal to the personal, the static to the dynamic, the silent to the word. So it is somewhat separated. And ignorance starts from the separation. We want complete, comprehensive, integral knowledge of the divine. It is for that the supermind is necessary. But it so happens that under the supramental knowledge of the divine, you also have the knowledge that divine wants self-expression in the world. So you now start applying the supramental knowledge through its infallible will to the lower nature. Why? To transform it. Why transform it? And I'm quoting Shrinder Verbatim. The transformation of nature is necessary for the complete self-manifestation of the divine in the world. So if you are doing internal yoga, don't do it for yourself. Do it for the divine. Some of you may know that after Shivendra retired to Pondicherry, there was a lot of misunderstanding what he was doing there and why. And he said, my yoga is not for myself, but for humanity. By which he meant that he was not seeking his own liberation, which is for him the sublime step of the ego. I seek my own liberation, not caring for you at all. But you are me with another face. So one's liberation is only a stepping stone towards the liberation of all. And if I forget that, I'm still being egoistic. So people started to misunderstand him. That was not seeking his own liberation. He was seeking the good of all humanity. So they immediately corrected his own statement. My yoga is not for humanity, but for the divine. Even then there was a misunderstanding. As if he was wanting to seek the realization of the divine. No. Realization of the divine is only the first step towards the complete self-unfoldment, self-expression, self-manifestation of the divine in the world. This is why matter has to be transformed. Please remember that everything is a formation of the conscious force. There's nothing which is not consciousness. Not that they're all conscious, but the stuff, the material, is conscious force. Each cell of the body is a formation of the conscious force, hiding consciousness in it. 
So in this yoga, it's the most effective means of arousing, awaking, making active the consciousness which is in the cell, which might be called unconscious consciousness. It is in itself, in essence, consciousness. It is outward manifestation, unconscious, semi-conscious, subconscious. To make this unconscious consciousness completely conscious, by which we could say, as Savitri says, even matter will remember God. In another statement, Sindha says, our purpose is to make matter aware of God. How can matter be aware of God? Only the divine manifests himself as a material divine, only then matter can know, I am God. So liberation is not of the soul, liberation is not only the mind and life, but liberation is of the body also, which ultimately means the cells, because they constitute the body. So Suryanda's liberation's concept of liberation is total, integral. Every part of the being has to be liberated, including the physical. Why? Because without liberation, divine cannot self-manifold himself. This self-unfoldment of the divine in the creation is the meaning, the significance, the value. This was the creation was made. So if we are coming to integral yoga, all of who actually have done, start from now to think in terms of the divine and not yourself. Brought yourself out completely. Do I become non-existent? No. This so happens again in the paradoxical way of the yoga. The more you forget yourself, the more you discover yourself. The self that you talk about now is not the self, the separative ego. The true self that you are is one with all. The true Atman is a bridge to everybody, which is another being in another form, which is myself. So this universality of consciousness, this totality of apprehension, this completeness of the application of the will of this knowledge to the whole field of nature. Why, again I repeat, for the self-expression of God in matter. This new self-discovery of the divine is what Shiva is working for. Incidentally, I may mention that this question is uppermost in many people's minds, even though who are devotees of Shiva Bindu. What happened to him? He didn't transform his body. He passed away. Why? I do not know if you know of the journal Shiva Bindu Archives and Research. Some of you may. In one of the issues of the particular journal, Sri Aurobindo Archives and Research, Sri Aurobindo published, or rather they published, the editors published, a diary of yoga. Sri Aurobindo is keeping a journal of his own yogic sadhana day by day. And one entry is, in this time, the Vidya Avidya realization will be complete. That by which Amritam will be accomplished will not be done. He is talking of himself. Now, Vidya Avidya, the Sanskritic phrase for what Shivinda calls the overmind. It is the knowledge of the one, and yet it has knowledge of the separation or preferences of the different aspects of the divine. So, it is Avidya from that point of view, not complete knowledge, but Vidya because it has got the knowledge of the one. That realization, he says, will be complete this life. Now we go back to another letter of Sri Aurobindo about Krishna. Here again, Krishna is an avatar in the Bhagavad Gita, is Purushottama, the divine himself. And yet, Krishna is a historical person. In that aspect, he is actually an avatar. In the Bhagavad Gita, is a classification of cancer. Some beings called Vibhuti. Extraordinary beings, in some way or other, have exceeded humanity in power, in some kind of talent, in knowledge, in love, in spirituality. They are called bhutis. Krishna counts himself as a bhuti. Vrishni nang vasudevoham, pandavanang dhananjaya. I am a vasudeva, I am the clan of Vrishni, that was the family that he belonged to. And Dhananjaya, that is Arjuna among Pandavas. He was a bhuti too, an extraordinary man. 
The avatar is also bhuti and is also supreme reality. But each avatar has a particular contribution to make to evolution of consciousness. Then about Krishna, he said that on the 24th November 1926, Krishna descended into the physical. Who's Sri Aurobindo's? Before that, he said. Krishna did not set out for physical transformation. He over-mentalized his mind and that's about all. In Krishna's own case, it didn't come down even to vital, all is a physical. How did Shrinder take evolution two steps forward? Over-mind came down into his physical. What does it actually mean in concrete terms? Every physical action was being conducted by the over-mind consciousness and will. And immediately adds, make a truth seeker and a lover of truth, that in this life, that is his own physical existence, which came manifested in 1872, 15th August, Amritam, the supramental immortality did not be achieved. So he did not fail his mission at all. Over and over again, he says, the transformation is not our work. Our mission is to bring out the supermind and join it to matter. That is a special mission. And he succeeded enormously, more than 100% in that. I happened to be at the ashram when he passed away. I saw the golden light myself. And I'm a bit skeptical about these things, though I believe in miracles, because there is no such as miracle. We call miracles something that happens, of which we do not know the laws. That's about all. If you had expanded your consciousness, you would know why the miracle has happened. It's not a miracle. It's perfectly natural or supernatural, if you like, from our point of view. But I saw this light, golden light, in early morning, in midday, in evening, filling the whole atmosphere. That's the surcharge of the supermind in his material body. Then it started to withdraw on the 9th of December. When the mother said, now the body has to be buried. You may know that the French doctors came, according to law, they had to keep, they allowed the dead body to be kept for 48 hours, for relatives to come or to make funeral arrangements, etc. They said, we don't see any sign of death in it, you just do whatever you like. And it stayed like that for 111 hours, almost. This is because the supermind had been brought down to the physical frame of Sri Aurobindo, and that was his mission, personally completely successful. Those who have been to Samadhi you will see that Mother has got a message. The material envelope of Shuravinda, not to Shuravinda, the body of Shuravinda, who have achieved all, who have attempted all, who have achieved all. How could you say this? Because what the body's mission was to force down the supermind, evolutionary or revolutionary, into itself. Fill the cells for certain hours so that it is established, then it withdrew. You'll also see in Shri Aurobindo's letter, he says, the further evolution after the supramental, which is the evolution of knowledge. Function is the leader of evolution in the world, knowledge, complete integral knowledge of the divine. But the further evolution of the anandam, the delight of being, the bliss of existence, that is not my work. So please try and understand very clearly, objectively, dispassionately, even though he is Guru, what exactly he was trying to do and how much did he actually achieve. He achieved much more than it was promised. This is the message that I brought to you from the ashram. Clarify misunderstandings. Don't expect too much. Don't build your high hopes without the sure foundation. As long as the supermind was not ready to come into his body, he went on to the last moment, last breath of his yoga. He never ceased to practice yoga. The theme of this confidence, evolution, evolution, transformation, new creation, they're all in one word summarized. The self-expression of the divine. It can be done by revolutionary means individually. It can an evolutionary way cosmically. If the transformation comes about, there will be a new creation. The new creation will be a world of knowledge, 
At the moment, it's a knowledge of ignorance. This world is a world of ignorance. That is to say, there is no knowledge of the self functioning here actively. We individually may go to the divine. The world doesn't. The world has to be made capable of receiving the divine in itself. And that was the self-discovery of the divine in matter. A new self-discovery, he says. So therefore, if yoga is union with God, how far can the union go? By the psychic being, the spiritual self in us, by the mind, life and body, all of this together, simultaneously, integrally. This is the mantra of the yoga, integralism. Nothing left out. Nothing accepted on its face value. Everything has to be seen in the light of the divine. Everything has to be seen. And the divine wants it to be done. Everything has to be done the way that divine has actually dispensed already. Is this complete determinism? As I said, dispensed already. No. It's not complete determinism. You have got freedom of will. However small it may be, however little it may be, however slight it may be, you are free. And if you are not free, you will never be able to seek the divine even. Who seeks the divine in you? The divine seeks the divine in you. That's why Srinanda says, it's a play of hide and seek. He has hidden himself and is seeking himself in the world. You talk of the fulfillment of God's purpose in the world. Is not God fulfilled? Is he not complete? Is he not integral? No, it is the God that is limiting the world that has got to fulfill itself. Srinanda has got a very beautiful sentence. The self that we have to perfect is not the original spiritual self that is perfect always, essentially. The self in nature that we have to perfect. The self in nature is not perfect. It is very much under the thumb of the ignorant nature. To lift that veil, that burden of the thumb of nature in us and invite, invoke, receive the supernature, which is the supramental nature in the totality of our being and personality. This is your task as an integral yogin. Who is your master? The divine. One of the mantras of the integral yoga is the secret of sadhana is to have the divine make your sadhana for you. Because he is the yogin. He is the seeker. He is the aspirant. He is one who is seeking the divine in himself who is limited as yourself and myself. This is the game he is playing. It's a leela. It's a free act. But an act which has a purpose. We have the concept of leela in Indian philosophy, in yoga, for a long time, thousands of years. Particularly during the last 600 years in Bengal, in the school of Chaitanya, whose name you may, some of you may know. Incidentally, Shinde speaks also of another great tradition of India. A hoary, timeless, Nobody knows his history, Tantra. And I've done some work in Tantra as I developed in Kashmir, which is a great venue of Tantric philosophy and yoga. There is one particular school, which is Shaiva. This Shiva is not one of the Vishnu, Shiva and Mahadeva, not the Trinity. It's the Shiva is here in the name of the ultimate reality itself. It calls it Pratyavigya school. Self-recognition. It says we know who you are, but we don't recognize who we are. So to recognize ourselves as Shiva, the complete integral divine. They also believe in conscious force. They believe in ascent of consciousness and a descent of consciousness. Great deal of similarity is here in this yoga, even though he didn't know about this philosophy and yoga till about the middle of 1930s. He didn't know of its existence at all. However, this philosophy talks about the descent of consciousness, which is the Shiva, the divine coming to material level and hiding himself there. Evolution, or the ascent of consciousness, is the discovery of Shiva in all levels of being. You see how similar it is to Sri Aurobindo. It's wonderful that these people, the philosophers in Kashmir, were also very poetic. In one particular commentary and a basic text, the commentator says, Aruha Obaruha Dola Kalim Kurvan. 
अनवरत ईश्वर अवस्थित इट लाइक कंपेर दि असेंट ऑफ डिसेंट ऑफ कॉन्शियस विथ स्विंग प्लेइंग ऑन दि स्विंग ऑफ डिसेंट एंड असेंट ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस ईश्वर ऑलवेज रिमेन वॉट ही इज दि स्टेबिलिटी एंड फ्लैक्स the complete peace and the movement the transcendent and the universal this is integrality which you find completely worked out in this philosophy on kashmir of shaiva but in his articles on rebirth and justice and karma chandra says that the translation of nature has been attempted by tantra and vaishnavism they came with an s of success I didn't quite achieve it. Why not? I've got some explanation why, but that may be taking us to too deep philosophical waters. Maybe it can come in the questions. But these particular philosophers, even though they say that you were limited Shiva, even then as Shiva in this philosophy, I'm limited God or the divine. It breaks all its fetters: space, time, causality. etc these are the fetters that bind us pasha they call them you break them one by one by their yoga it's a very effective yoga and you realize yourself yourself again pratyavigna know yourself again recognize yourself as shiva which is everything i am everything that is the realization you have including matter you are the physical body shiva become physical body Now, how near it comes to Sri Aurobindo, and yet, and yet, the greatest philosopher of that school says, "The whole party is a poor no moksha. Only on the fall of the body you can have complete liberation. So the body still has to be abandoned." Another disciple of Abhijit Gupta, this great philosopher I've just referred to, Shema Raja, he says in one little monograph. देह पाते परमशिव भट्टारक यू गेट कंप्लीट लिबरेशन वाइल योर लाइफ यू मूव लाइक शिव ऑल योर मूवमेंट्स एंड योर एक्शंस आर लाइक शिव बट ओनली ऑन द फॉल ऑफ द बॉडी वन कैन यू कैन कंप्लीट इंटरगल शिव सी ऑन ऑस ए क्वेश्चन व्हाई इफ इज बिकम द बॉडी व्हाई कैन द बॉडी नो इट्स सेल्फ एज शिव ऑल्सो इट्स अ वेरी सटल डिफरेंस you know everything as yourself as shiva but those things that you are they don't know that they are shiva see in this task is that all that divine has become for them to be able to know that they are divine including the body this takes one step forward the whole tantric tradition and yet shiva the left is body because he knew His body is not really capable of transformation. He told the mother also very easily. So his mission was personally to bring the super mind down and make it connected with matter. I have seen one message of the mother that the super mind has been active since 1950 individually, but on 20th February. it became manifest 29 february was it it became manifest and working universally so this is a progressive activity of the super mind going into different fields of the world existence and bringing out changes today there is a crisis in the world of all kinds conventions values ideas everything is breaking down why we suffer meanwhile great deal it is part of the divine scheme of things why so when they got a sentence one of the tasks of the superman is to break the mental mold we are all mental beings unless you break the mental mold you can't reach the superman so this is in the occult tradition something that had to come you go down to the nadir point then you get to the highest The superman is a link between the complete below and the complete high. In between, Sri Aurobindo the yogi is linking them together. This is how to see and look upon Sri Aurobindo. Personally, they are not in the least anxious that they should be accepted 
either as yogis or as masters, as gurus or anything. If I may touch a very personal note, I used to teach in England for a long time. I used to come back to the ashram every two years on visits. And I used to see the mother. She was extremely compassionate, kind, and gave me interviews. Once I had come back and she asked me, how were you working abroad? I said, I never speak or show that to anybody unless I'm asked. If you ask, then you will get. If you're giving a lecture in Indian philosophy, Indian yoga of current times, you have to bring Shirovinda, but not Shirovinda otherwise, separately. You know what mother told me? I'm quoting a verbatim. This is mother's own notes, I'm quoting her verbatim. This is exactly right. Do not bring my or Shirovinda's name into anything. Let the truth shine in its own light. Truth is our guide, not shown to the mother. And being unfaithful? No. They are our masters because they represent the divine. In the synthesis of yoga, Sindha says, I don't like this very idea of guru. The divine is the guru. And that is the Indian tradition also. There is one only guru, one spiritual master, the divine. What about Ramakrishna, Narabinda, and Ramana Maharshi and all their others? They are Guru Devas. There are many great yogis in whom the master aspect of the divine does not manifest. And there are many great masters who are not great yogis. This is again a paradox of the divine. It is a paradox. It is a paradox because he wants to make a complete harmony of it. That mean, reminds me of the wit and humor of Sri Aurobindo. In one letter he says, he goes on explaining things, psychology and metaphysics and all the rest of it, and then he says, I'm very sorry it is so complex, but the divine is complex. What can I do? So he really is very, he's very paradoxical because he wants to bring about a complete harmony of things. So this business of linking together heaven and earth, God and man, this is the message of the integral yoga because, again I repeat, what does the divine want? Not your liberation, not your transformation, but his own self-expression completely, comprehensively, integrally in matter. So matter, really speaking, is the one concern of the divine. In his own plane, he is what he is. Nobody really can touch him. You can't even approach him in one aspect. Completely silent, nobody knows where he is. But it so happens another paradoxically and harmoniously has come forward, has manifested himself. And in the manifestation, paradoxically again, he has hidden himself. To be pearl in shell. Break the bonds of the shell, bring out the pearl. You are all in prison. They were meant to make the prison a palace. About the supramental being, which is a supramentalized transcend body, she says, equipped to wear the earthly body of God. What is the earthly body? The material body. But how can it be the earthly body of God unless it is transformed, it is divinized? The means of doing that is the supramental evolution. What is evolution? We are using the word and bending it about. Sure, is not a biologist. He didn't take his cue from Darwin. His precise definition of evolution is this. I'm quoting him. Evolution is the emergence of the many from the human. The whole world is emerged, the world of multiplicity from the divine, this is evolution. On the other hand, it is also the evolution of the one from the many. And that is what is happening now in evolution. So all the four words have got you know, theme are connected. One cannot be achieved without the other. The new creation is a new matter, a new life, a new mind, and self-expressing a new divine. This will be the self-discovery of the divine. Thank you.
Uh, I think uh, if we have questions, then uh, I can come and give you the microphone. Please speak into the microphone so Professor Basu can hear and also it will be picked up by the recording. Professor Basu, I have a, a question. You mentioned that the... Uh, I can't hear. Oh. Could you come near it, please? I'm sorry, I can't hear. You mentioned that the one of the tasks of the supermind is to break the mental mold. Uh, and I was wondering, a lot of uh, sadhana, or a lot of what people do is to read the books, to read Life Divine, Savitri, the agenda, and, and try to um, use that as a means for furthering our sadhana. So I'm wondering if you could speak to um, how that how that can be done, or some advice in terms of, of using study to, to do that, to break the mold. Very good question. It needs really a very careful answer. You don't read on this book, so the mind. The mind has to have something, the chink in the armor. It must break to some extent, even this. You read the first paragraph of the Life Divine. You read it as any philosophy book, you do not understand anything. Particularly the second paragraph. It gives a twist there. When you go back home or wherever you are, read the two paragraphs. The first paragraph is self light, freedom, immortality, knowledge, etc. Second paragraph, he extends this to say that this knowledge has to be had by the body too, subjected to pain and suffering, but have an immortal life in it. Now, you can't understand this by mind. You read one paragraph, this is my concrete suggestion, don't be in a hurry. Don't read Life Divine as a philosopher. You know that the Sri Aurobindo declined the title of philosopher for himself? He was not a philosopher. 